Good morning. Hi, honey. Good morning, little Nikki. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm doing well. Good. So I just wanted to do an episode for the podcast that basically okay. showcases you, gives our audience and maybe new members to our audience a little insight into who you are as a person, and then also your background in the medical field and how you got into doing what you love and finding your purpose. So does that sound good for you? That's great. Okay, yeah. good. So let's start off. Why don't you just give us a little behind the scenes of where you, who you are, what your name is, where you grew up, and kind of start from there. Yes, my name is Ashu Goyle, and let's see, I grew up in Marietta, Ohio. So I was born in Milwaukee uh, to parents that immigrated here from India in the early 70s. And we ended up settling in a small town in southeastern Ohio called Marietta. And this is right on the border of Ohio and West Virginia, the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. And so I grew up in an area where my backyard was a national forest, which uh, is rolling hills, just beautiful woods. And I spent my childhood in those woods, like really connecting with nature on a regular basis, not in, not mindfully, but that's just how I grew up. And so it really was a grounding place to be. It had its challenges, you know, small town in the mid to late 70s, early 80s, and not a lot of resources there, but there are some really beautifully kind human beings and incredibly artistic souls in that area. And I was fortunate enough to have connected with several of them who really helped form the person I am today, and that was through music. Mm -hmm. So I discovered a passion for music. Pretty early on, uh, dad would always play like eight track cassette tapes of uh, all different kinds of music. Well, was, how old were you at that time? I was about 14, going on 15. When you, found, yeah. when you started getting into music. Exactly, when I really started getting into music and, and discovered. Tell, tell me a little bit about, not to interrupt you, but tell me a little bit about that time and kind of what prompted you to get into music. Junior high school, let's see, I was wrestling at the time, so I, I really became aware of fitness and exercise and really taking care of my body and promoting health and strength and building armor, if you will. I started lifting heavy weights when I was 13, and I started wrestling. And uh, at that same time, music was a big driver of my workouts, right? It was this force that motivated me and got me connected to my physical body. So... The more I started listening to music, the more I gravitated towards guitar music. And I was obsessed with the guitar, the sound, uh, just the vibrations. At the time, I didn't understand vibration, but really that's what it was. It was just the vibration of the guitar. And, like there, I couldn't describe it. All I knew is that I really feel this, and it does something to me. And so I decided I wanted to learn to play guitar. And so after much coaxing, they eventually did get me a guitar. And I beat on that thing for about a year and made a lot of noise, much to my sister and my parents' dismay. But <laughs> I would say for the first year, it was all noise. And uh, I got to the point where I was like, okay, I'm just making a lot of noise. Mm -hmm. So I took guitar lessons. It was probably once every two weeks. We did that for about three months. Okay. And then um, that kind of got me started. And then I started connecting with friends in high school who were self-taught musicians but very good at what at their instruments mostly guitar because that's what I was drawn to and I started surrounding myself with these people and through that I had a friend who turned me on to Pink Floyd okay. and and he's like hey I think you should really check these guys out and so he gave me a Pink Floyd album that, and I listened to it but I really listened to it and it moved me I was like, all right, I was used to guitar. The more notes, the better. Yeah. And then here's a band that has an extraordinary guitar player, David Gilmore, who could play three notes out my heart. And yeah. I was like, I want to learn to do that. So, and that led to other bands and other influences as well. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but that was my, my first true love 
was music. Yeah, your first true passion. And also, I think during teenage years is finding a purpose. You know, I think a lot of people go through hard times during teenage years and are trying to find themselves. So what I'm hearing from you is that music was really that outlet and allowed you to find a purpose and find a passion and a love that you could immerse yourself in. That's exactly right. Yeah, for me, it was my therapy. Yeah. I didn't know it at the time. It did serve that purpose for me. It was very introverted, very shy, um, had a lot of anxiety as a kid. You think growing up in a small town with no diversity and having, I, I stood out. <laughs> there were n no brown kids around when I was growing up. And there was a part of me that just wanted to hide and just blend and fit in, but I couldn't, right? So music allowed me to just be myself. I really found that space in music where I could just escape, whether it was an escape or whatever it was. For me, it was very therapeutic. And then I also had this community of friends, right? Some re really good people and good friends who we got to experience life together, right? Especially in high school, like we're learning, we're discovering ourselves, our identities. Music was that identity. And I ended up taking a really deep dive into music, not learning theory or notes, but sounds and vibrations. And ended up getting into bands when I was in, uh, in high school. Pearl Jam's out. And at the time, I was also really still into my classic rock influences, you know, yeah. Led Zeppelin, uh, Pink Floyd, The Grateful Dead, The Rush. But the lyrics kind of reflected uh, the early 90s, that teen angst, if you will, yeah. and yeah. You know, like not really fitting in with the popular crowd at school, but still finding a common thread that connected us all. It was music in the beginning. That, that yeah. was truly everything for me. And then, uh, and then off to college. Tell me about college. So you, you leave, so you have your high school experience and then you leave for college. Tell me where did you go to college and tell me a little brief uh, description of what that was like for you. Sure. Yeah. I was in high school. I knew I was going to go to college, but college wasn't a priority for me. It was just the next step. It's what I do. That's yeah. just what you do. You go to college after high school. Check the box. So, the box. Check the box. Exactly. So it's all I knew. Like, I didn't know that, I mean, that there were other possibilities or opportunities. So this is the next step in my journey. So I started off at the University of Cincinnati. Uh, this was uh, all in 92. And I was undecided my freshman year at Cincinnati. So I took some biology classes, took some history classes. But my heart really wasn't into that place because I had a girlfriend who was all the way across the state and near Cleveland area. And so doing a long distance relationship, it was the first love of my life. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't really know how to navigate that whole situation, right? So we ended up both transferring to Ohio University. I was taking humanitarian classes. I was taking philosophy classes, just everything but science, because that wasn't really on my radar at the time. What were your thoughts like? Did you even have then in your, I mean, you just said that science wasn't on your radar. Was medicine at all in your mind or was anybody telling you to try it out or was there, what was the feeling around medicine or science? Yeah. So being the child of Indian parents, okay. we were surrounded in this incredible community of Indian people that had migrated to that area. And many were doctors and physicians who were treating the underserved population. So they became friends with, with my family and in the years they've become family to me. Some of them I consider second parents. So many of them I do. And so that was my perspective on physicians, but you know, being the person I was very rebellious I saw doctors as very sterile, boring people who just didn't get it, right? That was my experience. Like, I'm never going to be one of those people, right? Because I've got this thing inside of me, and it's creative, and it's expressive, and that's what I want to do. And medicine was not that, at least in my head at the time. So first, uh, first year uh, at Ohio University, finishing off my freshman year, I took all the humanitarian classes, geography classes, and loved it. Philosophy, I excelled in the in that area. But um, that summer, between this was, this was summer 1993, between my freshman and sophomore years of college, uh, I uh, I decided to volunteer. So I volunteered at a local hospital, 
and there was a little bit of an application process. I filled out my application, and as one of my passions and hobbies, I listed playing guitar. So I went to Marietta Memorial Hospital. This would have been summer 1993, and uh, the person I interviewed, I can see him, I can't remember his name, but he said, oh, I see you play guitar. He's like, we normally have someone who plays piano on Sundays, for inpatients in the psychiatric ward and he's like unfortunately she's only going to be able to do this for another uh, weekend or two so he's like that's something you'd be interested in and I was like what do you mean I come and play guitar and that's volunteering and people will listen he's like yeah I'm like sign me up I'm like sweet so I can check off the volunteer box and but, but not but do something I love. So I put together like a whole list. I had a whole set list of songs. Um, and I, and I, I remember the first time I went in there. This is uh, Air Memorial Hospital in summer 1993. I'm in the psychiatric ward with my acoustic guitar. And uh, I just sat down and met the, met the inpatients there. And I started playing guitar. Mm -hmm. And it was all acoustic music. It was everything from Neil Young to Pink Floyd to... Led Zeppelin to the Beatles, and I would sing and play guitar, and they loved it. And so my volunteering time was supposed to be two hours, but they let me extend it to four hours that first time. And then they enjoyed it so much that they asked for they asked to, if they would if I would take requests. And so I said sure. So they would give me songs and. Cool. This is before internet. So, and did remember, you know all of the songs that they would request? Did you do? Would you improvise? No. So what I would do is I would go home. Oh. I'd find the tapes or the CDs, mm -hmm. and I would teach myself the songs. Yeah. So I'd learn the songs and then go back the next week, and I'd have three or four new songs. Uh, I kept mm -hmm. on doing this, and then one Sunday I was leaving the hospital, and this uh, gentleman was walking behind me, and he's like, "Oh, hey man, is that a guitar there you got?" I'm like, "Yeah." He's like, you mind if I take a look? And I'm like, no. And I handed it to him. And he's like, oh, it's a seagull. I'm like, oh, you need a seagull. He's like, yeah. He's like, I'm a guitar guy. And I picked it up and he started playing. And he was really good, like super talented. And I'm like, oh, wow, man, you're really good. He's like, yeah. He's like, so what do you do here? I'm like, oh, I'm just volunteering. I'm doing some inpatient uh, music for the in the psychiatric ward. At the time, I didn't even think of music therapy. But that's really what it was. Mm -hmm. And it was a nice little reprieve for the people who were stuck inside the hospital and they were unable to leave due to their medical conditions and they had a little escape. So he's like, oh, that's great. He's like, if you ever want to volunteer in the ER, he's like, I'm the medical director of the ER. I'm like, wait, you're a doctor <laughs> and you play guitar? <laughs> I'm boring. blown. I was like, whoa, I'd never seen or heard of such a thing. So he's like, yeah, he's like, yeah, I'm in the ER. He's like, I'm usually there on these shifts. He's like, you can connect with the volunteer person and see if you, know, you can just schedule. I'm there. I'm like, sure. So I did. So in addition to playing guitar on Sundays, I started volunteering in the ER on Fridays and Saturdays overnight, which really blew my mind because here was this doctor who was brilliant, watched his work in the ER. I got to see what he did. And he's making a profound difference. I'm saving lives, right? So that was really influential to me at the time. And he's a musician and guitar player, right? And we had a lot of the classic rock influence in common. So that went on for a summer. And then I decided I'm going to be a pre-med major. So I switched my major. Can and I then, interrupt you for a second? Yeah, of course. Can you yeah. Tell me about the process because I'm so interested. So you meet him. Tell me about like your mindset shift. And you had never had medicine like on your radar. It wasn't something. I imagine you were good at science because you're a very smart individual. And I imagine that science just came natural to you. But how did you go from, okay, it's not on my radar at all. You met this gentleman who sparked your intrigue and you started doing the ER rotation to then, okay, now I'm going to become a med student. Yeah, you know, I think it was just re just having that realization that, hey, wow, I can be whatever I want to be. Yeah, I can play music and I can be a doctor or I can help people on that level. I didn't know if I wanted to be a physician or not at that time. So that's really what it was. It was just it was a mindset sh mindset shift. It was it's just you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. And in that moment, I was like, oh, I didn't know that I could do this because no one told me I could do both. 
it was like, oh, you, this is what you do. You, these are your choices. And this thing that you love doesn't fit into with those choices. It's not an option because it's unfamiliar. So it's, it's not something that we know. I'm talking about my parents at the time, right? And today too, my parents, they just didn't know because I was so far from what their experience was. Right. It's so not black and white. There's like, there's some gray that can be kind of put in there. Yeah, but it's a blend of colors. It's not even gray. Yeah. For me, it was beautiful. It was not drab. It was very bright. Yeah. So, so I started taking the pre-med classes, and that co coincided with my girlfriend at the time taking pre-med classes because they were all the same classes. Yeah. And I found that I excelled, and after the first quarter, I had a 4.0 GPA. Amazing. And so then I started applying for research positions. I was like, okay, well, let me get into some scientific research because that's going to be interesting. I want to learn like what science really is. And I applied for a lab assistant position uh, and uh, this incredibly brilliant PhD cell biologist, Dr. Tony Brown, uh, decided to interview me. So I went into uh, the interview. I sat down and spoke to him. And I remember the first thing he said, he's like, you're the guy with the extraordinary GPA. And he's like, and at the time, you know, connected with all my professors. I was sitting in the front of the class. I was just a sponge. I wanted to take it all in. You're so and excited. I would, yeah, so excited. I'm like, I want to learn this stuff. And I really just developed a passion for the biomedical sciences and pretty much everything. In college, I was also really good at math. And uh, I took advanced calculus and I actually tutored calculus, which is crazy because I can barely do <laughs> algebra now but <laughs> at the time it's like all that all those calculations were, were fascinating to me same thing with chemistry like we could do these crazy long chemistry calculations and uh, and they just came natural and I figured out a formula and how, how to make it work and I would teach that too and then when I graduated so I did the five-year plan <laughs> for college so I didn't graduate in four years because my first year just was kind of just learning it was more of a discovery year for Finding me yourself. So. Exactly. And finding what I wanted to do. So it was more of a discovery year for me. And then once I was able to decide that I wanted to go the pre-medicine route and become a physician on some level, um, that became my focus. So that took four years to complete that. And then so I graduated in 1997. And I still wasn't sure if I wanted to go to med school. I was you now I really love music. I really want to do this. So I took a year off. Uh, I, I graduated June of 1997, and then afterwards, I, uh, I was playing music quite a bit and uh, hadn't applied to medical school. I took my MCAT, so I had those scores, <clears throat> and they're, I forget how long they were good for, but I had those pretty much dialed in and secured. So for the summer after I graduated, played a lot of music. Uh, and it wasn't really getting anywhere <laughs> and uh, it wasn't really manifesting for me in the way that would, that would have been sustainable. And that was probably a, a, a function of the environment where I was in Southeastern Ohio. There have been extraordinary musicians who've gone on to become su very successful. But for me, those resources were, I wasn't connected to those resources. So I didn't make them available to myself at the time. Mm -hmm. So I ended up getting a job as an orderly at the same hospital, Marriott Memorial Hospital, that I volunteered at. And uh, so I worked as an orderly. And during that time, I would work with the physicians and you know, I'd see what they were doing. And uh, I'd think to myself, I can do that. Yeah, I can do that. Like, I, I'd feel it inside of me. It's like, oh, yeah, I can totally do that. And I want to be that. I don't, you know, it's like, I enjoyed being an orderly. Because uh, there was a lot of connection there, especially I got to spend a lot of time transporting patients and talking to them while I transported them. Uh, and I'm just also running around the hospital, assisting whatever. Need, I, that's kind of what the orderly does. They do everything, just whatever you need to do, uh, whatever needs to be done. But I was still very intrigued by the physicians. You felt it, though. It wasn't so much of a, a mental decision. Obviously, you have to make the mental decision. It wasn't you weren't focused on making the this decision from your mind it was something that you felt like an inner knowing that this is the path that you want to go on and you should be going on 
Absolutely. That's exactly what it was. Like, yeah. I was like, oh, okay, this is what I want to do. And so I applied. So I ended up applying to medical schools. And I was really intrigued by osteopathic medical school just because I went to Ohio University. I was surrounded by DOs. Um, got into yoga in college at the time, too. And my yoga instructor, who is still a dear close friend today, her husband uh, was a DO and a professor at the, uh, at the medical school. And he also taught yoga. So that was another mind-blowing experience. In addition to the music, here's another physician who was teaching yoga. And very spiritual, very soulful, very creative. Now, the two of them, a yoga instructor and her husband, were instrumental in me also choosing the path to medicine. Because, uh, again, I realized I can be whatever I want to be. It's like it doesn't have to be one or the other. I didn't mention yoga became a passion of mine early and uh, when I got to Ohio University in 1993. I took a yoga class at college with uh, someone who's a dear close friend of mine to this day. And uh, she really taught me how to connect with my breath and how to connect with me and who, you know, who I am internally. And uh, she helped me open up a lot of doors and realize, wow, I got a lot of work to do. <laughs> we all do, but uh, it really became an awareness for me. So... With all of that, I decided to apply to medical school. I was very interested in DO school, so I applied to the DO school. Can I ask have... you a question? <laughs> so what's the difference between DO and MD? Yeah, that's a great question. So he's your traditional medical school. It's, uh, it's what everyone knows. It's a medical doctor. Osteopathic medicine is basically, uh, it's a branch of modern medicine, right? So it's still all the traditional training. We learn from all the same anatomy books, the same pathology books, all the same research papers, uh, same type of hospitals. Uh, the only difference is that there's a component of manual medicine, right? So we learn that structure creates form right? So it's all about getting the structure, which is the human body in perfect alignment and creating health from the inside out. That's a part I really resonated with. It's looking at the whole person. Yeah, you can specialize in this field or this field, but really you know, the emphasis in DO school is on all the basic primary care. Mm -hmm. to patients like really looking at the whole person so like a family doctor would or an internist would yeah. you look at the you know, cardiovascular system how it connects to the, to the endocrine system to the nervous system all of it the musculoskeletal system yeah. um, but i felt with do school there is a heavy emphasis on the musculoskeletal system too so that's really what intrigued me that and also um ohio university pioneered this program uh, it's basically a self-directed, self-learning program where uh, you learn medicine from day one through case presentation. So you're not in a classroom. So we were in, sm yeah, we were in small groups, uh, seven to eight people in a group. There were a total of 21 of us, I believe. And uh, we would meet three times a week with uh, a PhD scientist mm -hmm. and, uh, and then also uh, a clinical physician. So a DO or an MD who would basically guide us through these cases. And what we would do is we like take, for an example, a 55 year old person comes into the family practice clinic and they have a high blood pressure and some high cholesterol, something basic. Okay. We'd approach that. What does that mean? Okay. What's high blood pressure? We'll understand what that is and how our body creates blood pressure. What are the parameters that create that and how is it related? So. From that one case, we could do anatomy, physiology, pharmacology, pathology, all of it. And so the goal of the group was to go and teach ourselves different topics. We say, okay, let's do this. Okay, this person's on these two medications. So it's a creative way of learning. So you being this creative person, but then you also have side of you that is very book smart. And it's, it seems like it was kind of combining both of those together. Absolutely. Yeah, I think you really nailed it there, Nikki, because I don't think I was thinking of that at the time. But now looking back, yeah, it's very it's a very creative way to learn. Mm -hmm. uh, not only that, like from week one of medical school, we were in clinical rotations. So part of our curriculum was one day a week. We, we're in a primary care clinic or an emergency room or an urgent care. And we're working alongside of physicians. Mm -hmm. And so we get exposed to what most traditional medical school, you're not doing any clinical rotations till year three. So with this program, not in classrooms, so we have two half days a week. 
I believe it was two half days a week, where we're actually in a primary care setting, learning all the stuff and seeing how we apply the basic science and uh, the physiology to the patients that the physicians were taking care of in the clinics. So it was very comprehensive from day one. And I really love that about that program. So that's why I applied there. Plus I was a shoe in there. I think Harvard ended up adopting this model too, Mm -hmm. like around that same time. This was not, I went to medical, I started medical school in 1998. So, and I know by that time, Harvard had adopted the Ohio University program because it just made a lot of sense. And I know a lot of schools still do that to this day, but the only class, the only official class we took was anatomy. So there was a lot of discipline involved there, but there was also a lot of freedom. Yeah because I could create my own schedule. A passion of mine at the time was working out and doing yoga, and I did that every single day. I was in fantastic shape. The first two years of medical school, I uh, was at the main campus doing both clinical rotations and learning the basic sciences and the clinical sciences. Years three and four were more traditional. So that's where we actually go to a hospital and we do our rotations in every field of medicine. Okay. So my third and fourth years I spent in Cleveland, rotating through the Cleveland Clinic and various satellite branches of the Cleveland Clinic. And I went through everything. I thought I wanted to be an ER doc because that was my experience, it really changed my life and opened me up to medicine. But when I got to the ER and did two months of rotating through there, I realized that this isn't what I want to do. I just don't like this. I can't make this my, my passion or my career. I just didn't resonate with it. Right. And, I, and unfortunately, I did that with everything. <laughs> Family medicine, I was like, I like it. I don't love it. Internal medicine, I didn't, re- I didn't really enjoy being in the hospitals at all. I did cardiology, I did nephrology, I did oncology, and just crossed them off the list. Nope. And it was was becoming very discouraging. I'm like, is there something I'm going to resonate with here? Like, what am I doing in medicine? Like, I don't think I like any of this stuff. Like, enough that I want to do it for the rest of my life or whatever that meant at the time. But then I did a surgery rotation. And uh, that really changed everything for me. I enjoyed every aspect of surgery. Um, The one thing I didn't really enjoy was that uh, the surgeons, several of them that I worked with, didn't seem like very happy people. It was more of a lifestyle, it seemed like. And I was like, well, I like this, but I don't really resonate with how these guys are, these people are, these men and women. Uh, But the anesthesiologist sitting behind the curtain, twisting knobs, doing this, I'd hear them talk and they're talking about music. Actually, several anesthesiologists that I crossed paths with during my rotations were musicians and were flying airplanes, just extraordinary people. But they actually talked about a life outside of medicine, which to me was really important because, yeah, I love medicine, but I'm also very creative and I want to play music and I want to have some time to really enjoy my life and be well-rounded. And I ended up doing an elective in anesthesia. And one of the anesthesiologists I rotated with he was also a pain physician. And so he and I really connected. We had, a, we had the music thing in common. We loved all the same music. And one of them was a Grateful Dead. So we really connected on that and Led Zeppelin. Those were his two biggest bands and mine too at the time. So we started talking about that. And he's like, hey, you should come rotate with me through the pain clinic. And I was like, okay, I've never heard of such a thing. And so I'll never forget. So my, my I spent a week with, uh, I spent two weeks with him. So my anesthesia went from four weeks in the ORs to just two weeks in the ORs and then two weeks at the pain clinic. And the very first day, he, this is back in, this would have been 2001. Yeah. He, uh, he had a lineup of patients, procedures, and uh, it was amazing. Really, and he, this guy, he was really, really uh, extraordinary, but he trusted me to do these procedures and he taught me how to do them. Wow. And he would, he always called me hands. He's like, hands, man, hands. He's like, this is what you were meant to do this. And so I think that imprinted me on a little bit. But really what hit it home for me was he did a whole, uh, a whole learning of epidurals. And these were done in the hospital setting at the time. And so he'd have me go around and all the epidural patients before they could be discharged. And I'd do the notes. And there was one lady who was sitting up, smiling, big smile on her face. And her husband was holding her hand. He just had tears in his eyes. And mm. I'll never forget it. I'm like, hey, sir, everything went well. She's doing great. Because I thought he was really concerned that he hurt her or something. He's like, oh, no. He's like, I just haven't seen her smile for weeks. Mm. He's like, it's just, yeah. He's like, I'm just so happy. Mm-hmm. And I was like, whoa. Yeah. We can do that. Yeah. That can do that. That literally 
three minute procedure can do that. Not even three minutes, less than that. And I was like, oh, wow. Okay. I think I found it. Okay. A pain doc who likes the same kind of music I do, who's at the Cleveland Clinic, which is an amazing place, who's doing this. Yeah. And so I ended up doing a full rotation through the Cleveland Clinic. And at the time they had an acupuncture on staff. And the thing we didn't touch on was my passion for holistic medicine and really approaching health and healing from a multimodality approach, not just drug and symptoms. That's never been my my passion. So So. Yeah, so here I am at Cleveland Clinic, this world-renowned place, and they have an acupuncturist on staff who's treating pain with acupuncture. I'm like, okay, this is phenomenal. I found it, finally. So then I did. I applied, got into Cleveland Clinic for my anesthesia residency, did my pain fellowship there, and then I moved to Columbus, Ohio after Cleveland, did a year of private practice in Columbus. And th- that was a great experience. My first year taking, my first time ever taking care of patients on my own, coming up with plans. And it was moving because once I decided to leave, I decided to leave because of the weather more than anything else. I just couldn't take uh, the dreary, cold, gray Ohio weather. So, yeah, but I think you know, I was able to make a positive difference in a lot of people's lives there. And I was like, it, this kind of reassured me that I'm on the wrong, uh, that I'm on the right path and that uh, this is what I'm meant to do. But I applied to the, I applied for a job in sunny Arizona. Mm-hmm. I was like, okay, 300 sunshine days a year, I'll take it. So I joined a large group, Valley Anesthesia and Pain Consultants. And for the first year, I started off doing, for the first three months, was just anesthesia, just a little bit of pain because I didn't have a pain practice. And they were like, look, if we're going to have you come out here, you need to contribute to the group. So I was like, okay, we'll do that. But I ended up doing anesthesia at Barrow Neurological Institute and then um, also at uh, Good Samaritan Hospital, Banner Good Samaritan. And neurosurgeons there, I was fortunate enough to connect with and they were like hey look we'll send you patients your Cleveland Clinic you do this I'm like yeah I can do everything so they started sending me patients and by October of 2000 uh, 2009 I was I was out of the operating rooms and my pain practice was building so I built built a community here I call uh, Grateful Deadhead. Grateful Dead has fo- followers called Deadheads. I feel like I've got a collection of, uh, of patients out there that I call Goyle Heads that, uh, oh, yeah. that I just resonate with. Like I understand them and they understand me. Mm-hmm. Like, and that's what. And I still tell patients that to this day. Like we're, they're like, oh, you heard this person's the best. I'm like, well, really, no one's the best. It's the best is who's best for you. Yeah. And and I really believe that. Uh, I think for patients, especially in a field that's saturated like pain management, there's a pain doctor on every corner in Scottsdale and Phoenix, Arizona. Find one that you connect with. 99% of us are really, really good at what we do. And we're technically skilled. And I will say this too, when you're choosing a physician, choose one that knows how to manage the complications if something goes wrong. Mm-hmm. That's really what you're looking for because something can always go wrong and that's beyond our control. But you want a physician who can recognize those complications and treat them immediately yeah. so it doesn't turn into something catastrophic. It's a goal. But uh, so anyway, yeah, my, my pain practice grew and I had this following and people that uh, that I really just truly love. Yeah. They're people I really care about. Mm-hmm. So it started shifting in uh, around 2015, 2016. It was becoming more uh, corporate, if you will, venture capitalists, private equity, started getting into medicine because it can be big business if you have good insurance contracts. And in that process, over the process from, uh, say, from 2017 to 2020, um, it really shifted for me because I felt uh, that these corporations that, that are running healthcare are really taking the soul out of medicine. Yeah. And everything I went into it for didn't exist. It wasn't about the patient experience. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was about how many more people can you see? How much more money can you make us? It became a numbers game. Other, and I get it. Like if you're running a business, that's what you got to do. But yeah. for me, I just wasn't resonating with that. Mm-hmm. Got to be a way that I can do this the way I want to and really connect with people yeah. and develop relationships. And that's just what I went into medicine for, for the yeah. people connection really it's what it's about like I learned from people mm-hmm. and I've met some extraordinary people through being a physician and so the decision came to renew my contract with this corporate medical group and I decided not to and so after some intense soul searching yeah. 
and uh, major life experiences that you know, rocked my world. Uh, I I just really just found this. I woke I awoke, boom one day with the desire to start my own practice. I'm like I just have to do it my way. Yeah. I'm not sure what that way is, but I know that I'll figure it out as I go through it. And so that's what I did. So in June of 2021, hung up a shingle and hoped and prayed that people would come through the door and that the ones that, that resonate me, with me would find me. Yeah. And that's what it's been. So we started Integrated Spine Pain and Wellness in 2021. And I wanted this to be a fusion of not just pain management, but wellness and really helping empower people to heal from the inside out, to make better choices with their food, with their uh, with their lifestyle, exercise, with sleep, all of that stuff. And mm-hmm. my emphasis is try to stay away from medications and drugs. Not that they aren't absolutely necessary and that there's a place for them. My practice is just different. So, and that's it. It's like, you know, for example, in pain management, there are some people who do procedures that I don't do. And it's a choice. And I do some procedures that other people don't do. That's just a choice. Yeah. And so my practice is, has grown and evolved and is still growing and evolving into this more of a, a blend of integrative medicine. I believe in incorporating functional medicine, naturopathic medic- medicine approaches, osteopathic, chiropractic, energy medicine, mm-hmm. all of that, mm-hmm. diet, lifestyle, all of it yeah. together. Uh, and so the practice is growing into that more and more. And it's going to, it's growing and shifting, but that's what I truly enjoy doing. Yeah. And uh, like I said earlier, there's a pain doctor on every corner in Scottsdale and Phoenix. And uh, if people aren't finding what they need from me, there, there are other people out there. Like I tell people, whether it's my hands that help you or someone else's, I just want you to get better. Mm-hmm. Here's what I have to offer. If none of these choices work for you, that's okay. Right you can go somewhere else. There's plenty of people to choose from. And they're really nice people. It's like, this is my wheel. How this is my bag of tricks that I have. And this yeah. is what I'm, this is what I want to foster and grow. And some people really love it. Other people don't. And that's okay. Like I've learned through yoga, meditation, and just my life journeys, it's not to be attached. Of course. It's, it's hard. It's mm-hmm. hard because I want everyone to love me. Right. <laughs> There's that need to be accepted. To, we all, exactly. every human wants to be accepted. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, but I can only do what I can do. And I accept that I do have capabilities I have and that's it. So did you ever feel like you lost your purpose? Oh yeah. I, when the corporate medicine thing took over, they, they got me to a place where I was like, I can't do this the rest of my life. And it's the only skill I have. All I know how to do is take care of people. But if this was what medicine is, I need to find a different career. How did and you, that, was, that was just devastating. It was a real blow to my soul and my entire being. You went through it with me. I did. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You no, know, it was hard for me being on the other end because in my mind, it was so clear what you needed to do. <laughs> and I, I yeah. was trying to be the supportive wife and trying to help you. But it was something that you needed to figure out. And I didn't realize it at the time, but I realize it now. It was something you needed to figure out on your own, and it was a journey that you needed to go on in order oh, yeah. to come to that realization. So my next question was going to be, how did you get back to finding your purpose? What were those tools that you used when you were going through this time? Because I think so many of us humans go through these times where you lose your purpose, or maybe you're even trying to find your purpose. Maybe you don't even have it, and you're like, what do I do? How do I find this? Because purpose for all of us is so important. I think the saying is uh, the opposite of purpose or the opposite of depression is purpose. So your purpose can really transform you as a human. How do you, how did you get back on that track? Because just listening to everything that you've said in this conversation you naturally have lighted on this path of your purpose, naturally come into these different instances and different environments that allow you to continue on this journey and this path. So when you lost it and you were like, I don't know if I can continue it, how did you eventually get back onto that path of purpose? 
group I joined, Valley Anesthesia and Pain Consultants, when I joined that group, within a year, I was like, oh, I'm going to grow old with this group. I love this team so much. It was a large group, 200, over 200 anesthesiologists. Um, and it was dysfunctional, like any big corporation, any big medical group is going to be. But I loved it. I had to practice medicine the way I wanted to. Yeah, there was always uh, other people trying to pull some strings here and there. But at the end of the day, it's like, go into that room. I get to be me. I get to do it the way I want to do it. And I did that. And so once the private equity venture capitalist people took over and things started shifting, it really broke my heart because some people I really loved and cared about got laid off because they wanted a raise. And corporate medicine people, these uh, business people, they don't see people. They don't see the people who are there taking care of, of these patients and allowing me to do what I do and just the whole patient experience. It wasn't about that. So we started losing some really good people. Even on the business end, we lost some extraordinary people and uh, it shifted. And I felt like I was going through a divorce. I felt like this thing that I loved that I really, it was a part of my soul. I considered that group my soulmate at the time, my, my career soulmate. And so uh, it was hard. It was challenging. And so what happened really was you saying, hey, I think you need to go talk to someone. <laughs> and so, and then a few other people saying, hey, I, I think you say, really... <laughs> you didn't listen to me right away. Cause it, took, it, then, it took a few other people adding into what it I did. said. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did. But eventually you found an extraordinary person yeah. uh, who used to uh, talk a lot. Obviously, it's talk therapy, but then also EMDR, which was really beneficial and within, it was literally three months because this, that was September through December. And in January, I woke up and I, I found my passion and purpose. I felt it. I'm like, oh gosh, all this stuff that I've been polluting my brain with these negative thoughts and, oh, I'm so sad. What am I going to do? Blah, blah, blah. Like all this non-empowering thoughts yeah. just went away. I mean, it didn't happen overnight, but it was a process. I was, I was uh, seeing this person every week, consistently, mm -hmm. every single week uh, for three months. And it really, we made ex extraordinary strides. I learned a lot about myself, a lot about why I do what I do and, and who I am and who I want to be. And then those mental roadblocks just went away. All the barriers I had to just hanging a shingle and putting myself out there. Because this goes back to what I was telling you earlier. Like when I was a kid, I wanted to hide. I don't want my, yeah. I don't want my name out there. I don't want to be seen. You know? I don't want to be exposed because yeah. it's not safe for me. Mm -hmm. But doing you know, the work I did was absolutely incredible. You know, it's like, whoa, that's all. That's not real. <laughs> None of that is real. That's just a story I made up in my head. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the experience was real. Mm -hmm. but the story around it, I get to create whatever that story is. And so that's what I learned. And I was going through that process, it's like, boom, I woke up mind blown. I'm like, I remember I told you, I'm like, honey, I'm going to start my own practice. I still remember the day. Oh yeah. And you've been telling me that for four or five years, mm -hmm. oh, no, four years at that point, you're like, you yeah. just need to go do your own thing. You just need to go do your own thing. How do you do your own thing? I'm not like my friends who've gone out and started their own practices. Like those guys are on a whole different level than me. They have this thing that I don't have. Roadblocks talking. Oh, to yeah. totally. Yeah. Cause and then I you're like, at, when I looked at you, I see this incredible human being. Not only is he this incredible doctor and people just naturally love, he truly cares about patients. He truly cares about people. But he's also so smart and one of the kindest human beings. And so for me, it's like slam dunk, easy. Like get out there and start your business. Like you're going to have a line around the block of people who want to come and <laughs> see you. And But again, it goes into the roadblocks that we all have and that you have to believe it within in order to actually take the steps to do it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, and I needed help. Like I really did because right. uh, I didn't grow up in an environment where I was truly empowered. I was told what I can't do. That was a, you can't do this. You can't do this. You can't do this. You have to do this. And so and I think that's where music came in because it's like, oh, this is my escape from all of that. But yeah, I eventually I realized that I'm the only thing limiting myself mm -hmm. from what I want to do and, and who I want to be and do it the way I want to do it. So once I broke through that 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 illusion if you will right, exactly uh, yeah i started this thing and uh, and i love it i really do i think I it's uh, oh amazing i think so i've been blessed <clears throat> because my um 
my goyle heads i've had yeah. over five to six hundred that i've counted from my last practice that have followed me to this new practice and every single one of them is like oh my god you're so much happier oh my gosh this environment is so much more you and that's you, Nick. You know, like people come in, even still to this day, people are coming in and like, oh, wow, the waiting area is so peaceful. It's so calm. It's so inviting. I don't even feel like I'm in a doctor's office. And they come into the exam rooms and they're like, the style, the feel, that's all you. You created that environment, right? And um, I remember saying you, you wanted that office to be a reflection of me and how you yeah. see me. Yeah. What would your advice be for anybody who is in a path where they're trying to find their purpose or maybe they lost their purpose and they're trying to find it again? Drop your ego, get out of your head and go find someone to talk to. Mm -hmm. Go find someone who's non-biased, non-judgmental, who will listen to what you have to say and then call you on the stupid things that are going on in your brain that are self-limiting and self-defeating. Yeah. As physicians, you know, we're highly educated people, right? Mm -hmm. But no one te teaches us that. My friends who are very successful and entrepreneurs have figured that out along their mm -hmm. way, or somehow they figured it out. But not all of us get that, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you feel stuck, you're not stuck. You're just not realizing what you can do and, and what you need to do. Mm -hmm. And so I'm a big fan of mentorship, surrounding yourself by pe with people who are way more successful than you are, smarter people that are way smarter than you are. Like I do this all the time. Like I finagle my way into some situations and I'm like, wow, I can't believe I'm sitting at this table with these people, <laughs> like, yeah. you know, and, but that's how you learn. It's like, man, those connections are incredible. And those oppor those are opportunities that you can use to really expand your mind and tap into that thing that these people have. We all have it. We just don't know it. Yeah. You know, and it's all the same resources. It's just a matter of getting in tune with that vibration and mm -hmm. connecting to source. Some people, ha some people have it and some people do it. They just manifest, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, for some of us, we need some guidance along the way. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. You just got to drop the ego. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's my advice. Find people who can help you. Find people who can help you find your purpose. And it's not really that they're helping you find your purpose. They're helping you get out of the way of yourself so mm -hmm. you can reconnect with your purpose. <clears throat> just continuing to take the steps. One quote that I heard from Lionel Richie, when you feel fear, take another step. And so yeah. when you're in that state of fear or ego, not getting stuck, just continuing to make those steps. And like you said, just being open to the possibility because yeah. usually that will guide you down the path. And during this whole entire conversation and you know, what really is coming over to me, because I've heard this story, but every time that we talk about it and especially in this conversation there's more details that come out that play into everything but what i'm hearing from you is that there are times that you or even other people are going to get stuck and it can happen at any age it can you that when you were a teenager and you found music and then found it again when you were in college and then you again music guided you down that path and you didn't get into this place where you were stuck. You just continued to make the steps and see where your path took you. And it's really supported you and guided you every step of the way, including yeah. when you were an adult and in your career and you're thinking, okay, this is who I'm going to grow old with. And then life has a way of judging you and saying, well, I have plans for you. And the yeah. only way to get you on the path that you're meant to be on is we've got to create this private equity company to come in there <laughs> and buy your group. So you're forced to do so some soul searching and find out what you're truly meant to do. Because when I look at you and talk a lot about your hands, it's like the whole time I'm thinking your hands are magic and your hands are healing and they're meant to be working and healing people and healing the environment around you. Wow. It's just about, it's a matter of just offering something to, to the community and humanity. Mm -hmm. We all just need to do the best we can. I feel like the world is so divided. Yeah. And if people can come in, I have people from all walks of life coming to the office and I just want them to feel like they can just be who they are and, uh, 
and hopefully they'll just get something positive out of the experience about a crossing paths with me and my office staff. I couldn't do this without my incredible staff and mm -hmm. without your support and all the, all that you do for the practice too. And <clears throat> patients are, they're my extended family. They Absolutely. really are. I love and care about them very much. And so it's really about just helping them feel like they're empowered and they can get back to living the life they want to live. Absolutely. Couldn't agree yeah. more. I love this conversation that we've had. I feel like we touched on a lot and really got an insight to you and how you've evolved as a human and also as a practitioner. So thank you. The work in progress. You know what? It always is for every single person, no matter what point you are in life. And I think that it's realizing that in not having this attachment or having this ego to, oh, this is what I'm supposed to be doing, or this is where I'm supposed to be at. It's letting that go and just being open to being on a journey. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. I love you. <laughs> Love you too. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. It was nice. Yeah, it was nice talking. Okay. I know. Love you. I love bye. it. Okay. Bye.